Greetings and welcome to another edition of What's Next. My name is Zaki Anastasi and it's a great pleasure to welcome Andy Higgins, who is uh, a serial e-commerce entrepreneur. He's one of the godfathers of the e-commerce industry in South Africa. Um, and he is, of course, the managing director of uafrica.com. Andy, it's great to see you again. Um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you have been very busy during this lockdown period. But firstly, how are you and what have you been doing over the last three months? Thanks, Zaki. Good to see you too, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's been a crazy, hectic time for us. Um, we've seen quite phenomenal growth. Um, for me personally, uh, lockdown has been okay. Um, been working mostly from home. Yeah. Uh, being a bit of an introvert myself, I don't mind the decreased social interaction with people. Um, but what has affected me more is the restriction on movement and not having that sort of freedom that I'm used to having. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, I really can't complain. Uh, we've seen a lot of other businesses really struggle during this time. Yeah, um, yeah. And for us, it's been quite the opposite, really. So, Andy, um, I mean, you said you've seen some phenomenal growth in e-commerce, right? Um, we, you know, if you could just take us back, let's say, if you can take us back to December before we saw this coming, um, where were we as a country in South Africa as e-commerce in terms of percentages? I'm sure that we were not in double-digit numbers yet, uh, maybe wrong. And then all of a sudden, COVID-19 arrived, people were locked down in their homes, um, e-commerce arrived a few weeks after the restrictions uh, were, were kind of lifted. But can you give us an indication of how much growth we've seen in South Africa as a result of COVID? And where were we in December of 2019? And where are we now? So, yeah, so it's, it's more based on anecdotal evidence that we have. Um, but... Uh, Basically, the, the, the best, to the best of our knowledge, we, we're looking at about 1% to 2% of total retail in South Africa is online, if you look at, say, uh, last year's numbers. Um, now, now we're talking, December, we're talking December 2019, right? Yes. 2 to 3%. So if, you took, if you took the annual, the total um, retail sales that, that were conducted online, um, and, and from the information we have now, um, it pretty much looks like it's doubled across the board from, 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 from Corona, the sort of effect it's had. From my perspective, though, it's probably a bit more of catch up rather than really accelerating it forward. Because if you compare that to the rest of the world, um, most, well, certainly more developed markets, you'd be looking at between 10 and 20% of total retail would be online. So we've still got a long way to go. Yes. Um, but this certainly has accelerated us and, and, and forced us to do a bit of catch up. Sandy, that's quite interesting. So you say we moved and it's anecdotal, but I'm sure the numbers will come out. So December, we had about like 3% of total sales were online sales happening in the country. And we're currently probably sitting around 4 to 6% versus what's happening in the US. And I'm sure even those numbers, when they do come out, will be probably higher than the 20% you've just mentioned of online sales. But uh, it's interesting that we are still way far behind the rest of the world but I'm sure we, we're catching up pretty quickly. Have you seen this acceleration happening? Are we seeing a lot more online businesses in South Africa uh, during this lockdown period? So are a lot of businesses now opening shops and uh, you know, starting e-commerce platforms. Have you seen that? For sure. I mean, just personally, I've had so many friends and family and so on contacting me, asking me for advice on how to set up an online store. But I think it's also important to, to note that it's not, uh, we often talk about online versus offline, but it's not, not a binary thing. So it's not like you're either totally online or totally offline. There's really a, a bit of a blurring between the lines because there's a lot of new businesses that are starting up even where, you know, uh, people will go and shop on your behalf, for example, and they'll go into the store and, and shop as if they a normal on, offline shopper would, but then arrange for those goods to be delivered to your door. And there's a, a bunch of variations in between that. So I think it's important to acknowledge that, that, that it's not clearly online or offline. So I think also to quote the numbers can be a bit misleading. Yes. You get all these new apps that are coming, you know, like the Bottles app and other delivery apps where, you know, someone maybe still physically went into a store and made the purchase, but then delivered it to your home. Is that online or offline purchase? It's a bit of a gray area. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. But, but I'm sure that many uh, of the traditional retailers have been caught off guard. Uh, they, they haven't ventured yet into e-commerce. And they were, there they were in the middle of this pandemic and thinking, we cannot get our products to our customers. Um, are, you, are you seeing that in, in, in the case of the traditional online retailers who are now thinking, 
uh, like fast forwarding and they're saying we've got to make something happen. Is that what's happening as well in the industry? For sure. I mean, even just th those that were supposedly set up for online weren't able to co cope with the increased demand. So you take yeah. someone like even Woolworths, I think my wife tried to order, order food online. There was a two week uh, delivery time period. That's right. day was one week. Um, so, so yes, actually that's probably my greatest concern with all this yeah, is that, um, is that certain merchants perhaps aren't going to be able to provide a good um, experience for, for customers, which could actually have a negative impact. I think overall the, the impact is very positive, but I think uh, that is something that merchants need to be aware of. If they don't provide a good service, it could actually have, have be counterproductive as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, you're spot on in what you're saying. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's about the experience that you experience as a consumer when you want to order something. You mentioned two weeks. I've heard, <laughs> I heard some people that, that ordered some stuff at the beginning of March and the fulfillment date was the end of March from Woolworths. And I'm sure that they've got a lot of their logistics sorted out because at the end of the way, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about logistics and how you sort that out. But uh, uh, certainly, um, from what I'm hearing from you is that many of your traditional bricks and mortar stores are really um, adapting very quickly. They've got a long way to go going forward, but uh, they are making good progress and they are trying different variations of e-commerce. So I think it'll be an interesting space to watch. But I look at Take A Lot, for example, and the dominance that Take A Lot has in our market. Do you think the smaller guys stand a chance on a dominant uh, takealot.com.co.za? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a very similar situation to what's played out elsewhere in the world, in particular in the US with Amazon and other players. Yes. And I think it's also important to, to note that if you, if you talk um, smaller players, like small merchants, um, if you take Amazon, for example, more than half of the products sold on, on Amazon are actually not uh, supplied by Amazon themselves, but by third-party sellers. So that is the direction I understand Take Lots also moving more towards where they, to, in order to cater for what they call the long tail, um, mm. they're very dependent on those smaller merchants as well. So even in the, but having said that, in the, it, I think it is a threat that someone, uh, that a big um, single player uh, becomes the dominant monopoly. Um, and the, you, you are seeing certain resistance in uh, movements in the US, for example, because there's a cost to obviously trade on these platforms. So you can easily pay up to 15% or even more for, for lower price goods um, from the merchant. So you see a lot of people saying support, support small business, don't buy from, from Amazon, go direct to the, try to see if they have a website and go direct to them. And I think we'll see more of that happening in the future. So I think there is a future for this, the smaller players. But having said that, I think you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a threat that, that you get this natural monopoly forming. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you on some tips on those smaller players, because I think it's really something that I want to touch on. But uh, where, where, where do you see it going in two, three years from now on the South African market? Um, are we going to, we're obviously going to see e-commerce increasing exponentially. Um, do you think that a dominant player like Amazon could enter into the South African market? Where, where do you see e-commerce in South Africa over the next two to three years? So, so historically, many other countries have experienced that exponential growth at some point. Um, there's different terms for it. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell calls it tipping point or the yes. knee of the curve. Um, and I was always, uh, for a long time, I, I hoped, I mean, I've been involved for over two decades in the e-commerce space. I, was, I hoped that we would experience this in South Africa. But the reality is we've actually up until now only really experienced linear growth. Perhaps this um, uh, coronavirus situation ha has, has, has um, initiated that sort of exponential growth. I guess time will tell. I, I for one, haven't pinned my hopes on that and, and feel that even if we just continue on the path we are now with the linear growth, um, even for these smaller players, um, it is still a very viable, I mean, we're talking still historically pre-COVID, um, you know, 30 to 40% growth, which, you know, traditional retail would die for. I mean, they're probably going to experience negative growth this year. Sure. So I still think um, it's in two, three years time, um, in spite of this, we're going to be very well positioned and perhaps because of this, we'll be even better positioned. So um, like I said before, I don't think it's, it's, it's a case of, you know, pure online versus offline. I think you're going to see sort of a hybrid. Um, and for me, I think the, the key part where we're lacking in South Africa, and this is um, largely why we got involved in the logistics space, and that is um, solving the logistic challenges around, around e-commerce. Like I say, you can, you can order something um, through, uh, you know, 
through telephone, you can order through a website, you can, there's different ways of placing an order, but the, I think ultimately the challenge is still getting those products to your customers. And that's the logistics, the, the logistics challenge. So yeah, so, so two, three years mm -hmm. time, I think you're gonna see um, a, a lot more people trading, but I think it's gonna be more of, of this sort of hybrid solution between online yeah. and offline, not, not specifically just one or the other. So Andy, I mean, it's interesting you talk about the logistics. I would have thought that logistics is quite mature in South Africa and, um, and, and probably um, you know, more mature in many developing countries around the world. Um, and yet you say logistics is a big challenge. I mean, if, if you had to put your finger on it, what would you say would be the reason why we haven't had the same explosion with that in other countries? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it a trust issue? Is it logistics? It, what, what is it? Why have we not had this kind of growth? Aki, I don't know the answer to that. I've, I've surmised and put a lot of thought into it and I can't say for sure. I think it's a combination of, of all those things you've mentioned, trust, security, yes. logistics, um, culture, I think plays a role. Um, I think we ha historically have had a very strong shopping mall culture. For some reason, people like to go to shopping malls. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not one of those, but I think my, a lot of people do. Um, and I think just maybe yeah, there's some resistance to change. So yeah. this uh, coronavirus situation has forced people to change their habits. And I think people may be seeing the light. So yeah, I don't know the exact answer to that question, um, but I do see it changing, which is positive. Yes. I, I would agree with you there, Andy. And I think that uh, you know, once people experience the ease and the pleasure and the, the convenience of uh, shopping online, I think it's gonna change. And I think a lot of people have experienced um, uh, online shopping for the first time in uh, during the lockdown period. So I, I would love for those people to be more vocal and say, "Hey, this is uh, this is my first experience buying something online, and this is this this was my experience. If it was good or bad, etc." But I've also seen some really amazing success stories, like niched businesses that were launched online during this COVID. And I, I have a friend of mine who started delivering fresh produce, you know, like you could order vegetables and fruit and you do it via an app, they would be fulfilled and they would get that, those, you know, fresh produce products delivered to their homes, which was quite amazing. And she's had quite a, a reaction to people wanting to do this online. So my question to you is with your experience, Andy, what advice do you have for, for small entrepreneurs? You know, people might be unemployed. People have been retrenched not right now. Somebody's got a great idea to launch some kind of platform, some kind of service that you can get goods from uh, A to B or launch any kind of e-commerce platform. I mean, we're not just talking about goods, right? It could be software. It could be a whole lot of different things that determines what e-commerce is about. But what advice can you give a small guy who's literally wanting to start something up has an idea um, and doesn't know how to go about doing it. Because when you automatically think of e-commerce, you think, oh, it's going to cost me a fortune. I've got to develop an app, which is going to cost me a fortune. I don't have the expertise. I can't do this. I'm not a technical person. What advice does Andy have for that entrepreneur that has an idea and yet doesn't know how to implement that idea? Yes, I think you mentioned local delivery. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, so my advice would be to get going with something as quickly as possible without trying to build something that's perfect. I like this, this saying that says, you know, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Because invariably, what you think you need is not what um, you actually end up with. So rather get going with something, um, even if it's a very crude, basic, simple system. Um, and on that note, there's no need to build software yourself. There's so many solutions out there, software as a service, that you can pay a subscription fee or even get a free trial and try it out. Um, I've had people approach me for advice and they've, they, you know, they want to hire developers to build this app because it's got to work a particular way. Mm -hmm. so my advice would be, even if you have to compromise on how you ideally want it to work, which in my experience normally is not how it ends up working anyway, yeah. um, after you've got real world feedback, um, rather compromise on that and get something simple going as quickly as possible, as low cost as possible, and then iterate on that as you go forward um, and get feedback. Um, you know, in software development, we talk about agile methodologies. So yes. that's something where you can make small changes very quickly and based on the feedback you get from your audience. 
because you'll find probably what you had in mind in practice is not what you're going to end up with. So if you had gone and spent a whole lot of time and paid a whole lot of developers to build something, it invariably ends up being wasted in any case. See, that's interesting. So, and, and I love your advice. Just start somewhere. Do it. Start somewhere. It's not going to be perfect, but get going. And as you go, you kind of uh, evolve as you go. I was very interested to hear you saying that uh, where the opportunities lie, and the big opportunity lies for local deliveries. Could you expand on that, please? Well, I think historically people would have just, you know, preferred to get in their car and drive to a shop locally or to the restaurant even to get takeaway. Um, and I think now that's changed. Um, so, and I think that that's where, where maybe there's also the opportunity for the smaller guys because you don't have to build this nationwide system, you know, have a huge marketing campaign. It's easy, you can just target your local community, even if it's for something as simple as bread and milk delivery. Um, and I think the key here for me is to, is communication. So, so, so what highlighted this for me is a lot of the apps out there, even uh, from well-established uh, companies, um, and this is the key for me with any, any of the e-commerce, is actually boils down to communication. So a simple example of this is if I ordered something from, from Woolworths or Pick and Pay, I say, uh, I, I give them my, my, my list of things I want to, want to buy. And let's take an example, my wife had in mind a particular meal she wants to um, make for tonight. And so she has the five ingredients that she needs to make that meal. Traditionally, what happens is, is um, you, you, um, one out of five of those ingredients was not available for some reason. So when the guy comes to deliver, they deliver four out of those five ingredients and she can't actually make the meal because she needs that one ingredient. So some of the more um, progressive app, apps that are doing this, what they will allow you to do, the, the driver or the, 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 the buyer, while they're in the store, they'll say, this is not um, available, but can I replace it with this product, for example? And immediately, and they give you a time period to respond, and immediately you could respond and say, yes, replace it with that. Um, and then, you know, it, you actually get what you want in the end. And so it's, it's that type of thing that I think that you can innovate around and maybe even do better than some of the bigger players. Um, yeah, so that's just a simple I, just, I love that idea. I love that idea because, you know, you often order something, it's not available, but you, you want an alternative, but because it wasn't available, they didn't get you the alternative. Uh, so you're yeah. saying give that... Uh, you know, that communication platform to be able to communicate in real time uh, will fulfill a lot of, uh, you know, will, will increase that satisfaction levels quite significantly. Andy, you, you spend a lot of time online e-commerce. Have, um, have you had any amazing experiences? Uh, you know, who's doing it right in South Africa at the moment with e-commerce? Um, look, I think take a lot is doing it right. Um, for me, again, the, the key around e-commerce is to manage your, your customers' expectations. Um, okay, so first, you need to establish all that trust and you know, provide them with the choice and, and provide good pricing and all of that. I think that's a given. But, but for me, the, the, what separates the, the, good, the good from the, the mediocre, the ones that communicate really well. And that often is, is happens you know, once the order is placed. So and reassure the customer that the order's been placed, um, it's been picked, it's been packed, and, and, and actually even before that, to communicate with them when they can expect delivery. I think that's where a lot of e-commerce merchants fall down in South Africa, is not communicating that up front um, when you can expect delivery. And in my experience, it's not so much about the speed of delivery, but it's about just um, yeah. communicating when it's going to happen. You so know, it's so if it's true. Three or four days, that's fine. But tell them, and if there's a change to the process, keep the communication channels open. So it's all about communication, communication, communication. So it's I think so it's simple. It's getting those basics right. Yeah, it's so true. Hey, I mean, I've I've had a couple of experiences in the last three months, and the thing that's irritated me the most is when you say to me, "You will deliver on X day," and it doesn't happen. I, I know that stuff happens, and, and, but just communicate with me. Say that there's been a delay or something. But the organizations that don't deliver, and if you make a promise to me, and you say that we will deliver on this day, this is when you can expect your delivery and it doesn't happen, phew, uh, something so small can really push you as a consumer out of that e-commerce platform. Um, and Andy, um, just like overall, um, uh, over the last uh, few months, have you had any aha moments? Doesn't necessarily have to be e-commerce related, but is there anything that's like you've said, wow, that's like really, really interesting that I've just seen or I've just read as a business person, as the head of one of South Africa's most prominent e-commerce platforms, have you had an aha moment? Um, 
I'm trying to think. There are probably a lot of black mini aha moments. Um, I wouldn't say anything sort of major. If I could say, I think what I will say to that though is um, what I've realized is, you know, everyone's asking about, you know, what's 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 been so innovative and what can we do that's that's you know that, that we break the barriers and all of that. And I actually think that just doing the basics right has been is reinforced in my thinking. It's like everyone wants to try and like do, um, you know, add all these bells and whistles and do something like really a breakthrough. And in my view, I think what I've realized is if you can just do the basics right. So for me, from an e-commerce perspective, it's about providing that uh, choice, the catalog, um, providing multiple payment options, and then it's really um, providing a good delivery service from the logistics point of view. So I think for me, it's not nothing profound, but it's it's really about just you know sticking to the basics and doing it really well is more important than ever. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good good advice, Andy. And uh, Andy, thank you so much. Your your insights have been absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, put on your thinking cap now. I'm going to ask you where you see it in five years from now. Um, I'm I, I think you're the optimist like myself, and I think that we will probably see that double digit growth. But if you just look at it in South Africa, from a context in South Africa and globally, you say globally we're sitting at about 20% in markets like the U.S., for example. Are you expecting that market in the U.S., that number to go up to, say, 30 to 40% in the next five years? And where do you see South Africa going in the next five years? So some of the initial numbers that Shopify published, published um, post or during lockdown showed actually growth of 30 to 40% in the US and in North America. So that, that is possible to, to achieve those sort of numbers. Um, I think uh, I'm, I am an optimist. There's no question about that. I'm very positive. But I'm also trying to be, as I get older, a bit more of a realist. And I, t I do think that um, while we're going to see good growth, I do think, um, I do wonder if we're going to, you know, once a vaccine comes out, and so on, but we are going to somewhat fall back into our old ways a little bit. Um, maybe that's not normally that skeptical, but I do wonder about that. So I think this has given us a boost, and I think um, yeah, so I think we will maintain it um, to a large degree. But what happens in sort of five years' time, I'm I'm less sure about. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've tried to guess these things before, and I've got it wrong. That's why I'm reluctant to do so again. Um, but I, but. My view in, in general is that you'll see a more of this sort of hybrid. So, so, so you'll, you'll need to see technology that integrates between online and offline. So you'll see someone, you know, your point of sale system will need to integrate with your online system. And you'll see that sort of morph more together into one. So it will become less um, clear as to what's online and offline. And more just, you know, online, uh, home delivery is an additional option, whether, you know, through whichever channel you buy from. And I also see people will, um, merchants will, will, will use more different sales channels. So they'll use, they'll have online and offline and everything in between. So they might not have as much of a physical presence, but they might have like pop-up stores, for example. Yes. So, so rather than have a store open 12 months of the year, they'll say, um, it only makes sense maybe over December and I'll have a store um, and maybe even take up some physical space in the mall, but I only do that for certain types of times of the year that are peak for me. And they'll need to have systems and platforms that can manage that variability within the different channels that they use to sell their products. So I think that's that's sort of more generally where, where we're heading. Very interesting. Andy Higgins, it's always really, really good to see you. Uh, wish you well over the rest of this uh, uncertain period. We don't know where we're going, but I wish you growth from strength to strength. Thank you for your interesting insights into the e-commerce industry in South Africa. And uh, thank you for joining us on uh, What's Next. Thanks, Lucky. Thanks for having me.